This evening, we will be honoring outstanding individuals who have devoted their lives to protecting our country and caring for our nation's active military personnel and veterans. Our first speaker this evening has led the way for women serving in the military. As a result, she is also the worthiest of recipients of our National Society's Margaret Cochran Corbin Award, which pays tribute to the first female to earn a military pension from the U.S. government. Margaret Cochran was born in 1751 in what is now Franklin County, Pennsylvania. At the age of 21, she married John Corbin. At the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, he volunteered with the first company of the Pennsylvania Artillery. And like thousands of other wives and mothers, 25-year-old Margaret, known as Molly, followed her husband into battle to serve as laundress, cook, nurse, seamstress, and fellow patriot. In the darkest days of 1776, when the Continental Army was in retreat after the disastrous defeat in New York, the Corbins found themselves within the walls of Fort Washington in the northern reaches of Manhattan Island. On November 15th, fierce shelling bombarded the severely outnumbered American troops. John was a cannoneer, and when he fell mortally wounded, Molly rose to man his weapon. She did so with such accuracy that her position drew especially heavy fire from the Hessian field pieces. She was struck three times, one wound nearly severing her shoulder. Taken prisoner, she was ultimately paroled and sent to Fortress West Point, where she would live out her days in the Corps of Invalids. The Board of War granted her a regular pension on July 6, 1779, to be valued at a soldier's half pay and a new suit of clothes, new suit of clothes each year. She died and was buried in an inauspicious grave until 1926, when New York members of the DAR had her remains exhumed and positively identified due to the damage documented to her shoulder. The nails from her coffin were sent here to the DAR Museum. Each May, daughters are invited to the ceremony to recall Captain Molly's sacrifice as her reinterred burial site in the historic West Point Cemetery. And each Continental Congress, the National Society salutes her bravery, her patriotism, and her legacy by presenting this award, which pays tribute to all of the brave women who have since worn the uniform of our nation in all branches of our military. Few recipients are as deserving as tonight's honoree and keynote speaker, Lieutenant General Michelle D. Johnson, Superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy. She is the first woman ever to serve as a superintendent of a United States Department of Defense Service Academy. And I hope you will join me in a round of applause saluting that outstanding achievement. General Johnson graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1981 in just the second class in which women were enrolled. She excelled there, becoming the cadet wing commander, the highest ranking senior cadet, and a two-time All-American athlete. But that was just the beginning, as General Johnson has blazed an impressive military record of accomplishment in the nearly 35 years since her graduation. Among many inspiring duty assignments, her service as Deputy Chief of Staff Operations and Intelligence for the military headquarters of NATO included crisis and operations planning and execution of NATO missions in the battlefields of Afghanistan and Kosovo, in the Mediterranean Sea, off the coast of Africa, and the skies above Libya. She led the team charged with developing cyber policy and a new military cyber command while on the Joint Staff which is composed of officers of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force who chart the strategic direction, operation, and integration of all land, naval, and air forces. It is little wonder that she is a sought-after speaker on topics such as leadership, under overcoming challenges, and future opportunities. General Johnson is a native of Spencer, Iowa, and she and her husband are the proud parents of 12-year-old tw twin boys. From airlift and tanker pilot to commander of the 97th Operations Group, from teaching within the faculty of the Department of Political Science at the Air Force Academy, to serving as Director of Public Affairs for the Air Force and aide to both Presidents George H.W. Bush and William Clinton. From representing our nation as a Rhodes Scholar to her induction into the Air Force and 
Colorado Springs Sports Hall of Fame in recognition of her track and basketball accomplishments. General Johnson is an exceptional individual who represents the very best in American scholarship, athletic achievement, valor, and patriotism. We honor the memory of Margaret Cochran Corbin with this award as we pay tribute to women in all branches of the military for their extraordinary service. It gives me great pleasure to present the 2015 Margaret Cochran Corbin Award to Lieutenant General Michelle D. Johnson. Please. Thank you so much. President General Mrs. Young, it's an honor to be with you this evening. It's an honor to be in this amazing historic place with this amazing group of people. And I don't know that anybody can be worthy of uh, Molly Corbin's memory, but thank you so much for including me in this wonderful event. I think many of you may have had this experience, but in my life I've met people from other countries who after seeing our popular culture are shocked when they see what Americans are really like, that we remember our history, that we honor our fallen, and that we serve each other so generously. So it's fabulous to be part of this, and I'm honored to be in this esteemed group of people who've given so much for our country and to continue to do so. Thank, thank you for letting me be here tonight. I must say, when the parade of flags came in, um, my roots are still in Iowa, so it was great to see the Iowa flag. <laughs> But I've got to give a shout out to my, my current and, uh, and continuing neighbors in Colorado, the great folks who helped me come here today. In fact, uh, ironically, a couple of weeks ago, my family and I were in Ireland. I was at a college president's conference in Dublin, and then we spent the remainder of our time there as tourists. But I think that my ancestor uh, that gives me the chance to be a part of the DAR uh, was actually Irish. So. It's all coming together. It's great karma right now. This is fantastic. This is great. I, um, the first time I really had a chance to open up my life, I had a chance to be involved with another service organization that had uh, Boys and Girls Nation in 1976 to mark the bicentennial of our country. It was the first chance for a, a farmer's daughter in Iowa to ride an airliner and to come to our nation's capital and to meet kids from all across the country and realize, you know, it's a big world out there. I can, I can play. I've got game. <laughs> I can do this. And, uh, and the things you do in the service organization to reach out and inspire others is extraordinary. You're lifting up others and lighting their fire, and they'll, they'll be standing here in a few years as well, I know. That's fantastic. We're living in such a historic time in our country. Um, I'm so grateful that you noted that even though we may not technically be at war, um, the war that, that our young people are, are helping um, serve in is a difficult one. It's hard to know where the front lines are, and it's a global one. We fight it in a joint way, which in the 1980s may have seemed new, but it's just natural uh, that we don't just compete with each other and joke with each other, but soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, merchant marines, coast guardsmen uh, work together. We need each other. We're networked. Uh, it's a new world, and we I could fly people around and cargo and air refueling aircraft, uh, but I might also serve in other ways with, with ground soldiers, sailors, and people who are doing things behind the scenes that I don't think many Americans really understand, so thank you for trying to understand that. Less than one half of one percent of Americans serve in uniform anymore, and so I find it difficult sometimes for people to understand what we really do. The images in the movies don't help us very much, um, although it's great that the enlisted as uh, troops are always seen as very honorable. It's a little troubling that the generals usually are seen as corrupt and stupid. And, um, <laughs> so I, I hope that uh, we don't portray any of those things. But uh, you truly understand the nature of what we do, and we're grateful for that. Um, we've been an all-volunteer force for over 40 years. And that's contributed to, the, to the, the fact that fewer people really understand how we work and what it means, and that we're regular people, we're your neighbors, we have kids in school, and we have husbands and wives and daughters and sons, and uh, thank you for keeping that alive and helping people understand uh, what we do. What's troubling, and I will tell you, just um, 
on Thursday, we had our newest class, the class of 2019, came to the United States Air Force Academy. I understand West Point will be entertaining class of 2019 on Monday. Um, and so we brought in another 1,242 uh, cadets who we hope will graduate in four years and be lieutenants and lead in our Air Force uh, in our nation. But I'm finding there are people around the country who don't know we have service academies or what they are, that they're fabulous institutions of higher education and the, the bachelor's degrees that we award there are for not just science and technology but also for the humanities because even though it's a technical Department of Defense that we serve in, we lead humans and people need to know history and poetry and the human condition to be able to lead thoroughly and those, that's what we produce but so many people don't know that that's what we do. And so I hope that uh, you'll take that to your heart and you'll come out to see us at, at the Air Force Academy in Colorado and then go see West Point where Molly Corbin's buried and go over to Annapolis and understand what we, what we really do. It's such an honor to be part of this with young people. Uh, we need them to be model citizens and to be healthy and fit in body and mind and to be able to be creative and be better than we are so that they can tie together the cyber, the space, the people with boots on the ground and and at sea and link it together in creative ways to face these creative these uh, threats that we face which people are using creatively against us in too many ways uh, so we're, again we're so thankful for what the DAR just does to preserve in our nation the sense of that we're all connected and that we're not divided by wearing our different uniforms but that we're all more as one in fact I tell people we wear uniforms but we're not we are not uniform we bring different talents and abilities and you can see it tonight on display, and it's so phenomenal. So thank you so much, all of you. And I think a special thanks go out to the pages who seem to be doing most of the work. And that's, really <laughs> awesome. thank you. that's great. So, so like me, some of you may be of a certain age and be able to remember the 1970s, and not just the bad clothes and the music. Um, <laughs> But things changed a lot in the 1970s, and it's really playing out now. And so I feel like I've lived my adult life on the bow wave of history, really, and can't claim credit for timing, uh, just to hopefully can be ready for opportunities when they arise and, and, and responsibilities of service when they arise. But in 1975, President Ford signed legislation that changed the role of women in the armed forces so that women could attend the federal service academies and f go to jet pilot training. Uh, in the Air Force indeed. So when I went to the Air Force Academy in 1977, I was in the second class that was co-ed. And, so, uh, and since then, it, it takes about so long to build you know, a career and to serve. And so right now, I'm so fortunate to have been in a position to have a chance to lead at the United States Air Force Academy and try to bring what I know to bear. Uh, but we can't really forget where we came. I know General Vaught, I saw earlier, was here. And she has been an icon in the Air Force and one of the first women generals in the Air Force and would come and talk to us at the Academy. And many of the cadets then, including myself, did not understand that things were different before 1975. The women were not promoted on the same track and were not serving in the same roles. Although many times were pressed into service in different ways. Uh, not exactly the same way Molly Corbin was, but if you talk to women Air Force service pilots, World War II, and there may be some in the room, are there any wasps out there? I hope that you get to meet some of them before we lose them uh, because they were, combat, cargo, airlift pilots in the day. Do we have, ma'am, do we have a, a wasp? Awesome. <laughs> so when I was a captain a million years ago in the 80s, I was flying a C-141 in South America and we had a, a passenger on board and he came up and was looking at the flight deck and he started to chuckle and I said, what's so funny? And he was looking at me, I was the aircraft commander and uh, he said, well, we didn't have women pilots in my day. And I said, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> and then I asked him off the cockpit, so you can leave, you can leave now. So that's phenomenal, I'm so glad that you're here. This is fantastic. So, when I went to the Air Force Academy, there was a cap of 12% of the cadets could be women. It's a little weird. Um, we don't have a cap now. Uh, it's around, we're around 25%. We're headed toward 30% uh, we, to try to make the, the transition. So uh, 
we're looking for diversity in a lot of ways. Our country has doubled in size since the Air Force Academy came into being. Our first class graduated in 1959. So we're a bit young. There are people in the Army who still wonder why we left. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, our country is more diverse. It's, it's, we're so blended that the boxes that describe our backgrounds almost don't apply anymore because so many of our families have maybe four or five traditions, ethnic traditions or nationality uh, backgrounds or faith traditions, and they're proud of all of them. And so it's become a much more diverse mix. We have people who are in operations, not just flying, but in cyber operations. And we fly, actually fly a satellite uh, in conjunction with uh, Space Command. We have to borrow a rocket, but uh, we fly a satellite as well because of the way the nature of the profession of arms has changed. And so uh, it's an amazing group of people that we've, we have. Um, we had a, a Tuskegee Airmen visit last year. Every year the Tuskegee Airmen come out and, uh, and we honor them because they're brave, brave men and, uh, and, and their wives as well because it was not an easy time for them and, and their families in those days. But one of the Tuskegee Airmen in the tradition of fighter pilots gave me a very hard time about why didn't you go to fighters instead of heavies? And I said, sir, you might understand this. I wasn't allowed to. In 1984, when I went to pilot training, I went to Oxford after the academy and to study as a Rhodes Scholar, and I came back to jet pilot training. And women could fly tankers, trainers, or transports. And uh, it was great. I had a chance to fly C-141s, loved the mission. We could be carrying, sometimes carrying troops or weapons or humanitarian supplies or patients, and it just it was a very rewarding career. But a little weird to be told you can't do something just because of, of what you look like. And uh, in 1993, that changed, and women started flying combat aircraft, fighter pilots. So we've had women Thunderbirds and, uh, and fighter pilots uh, along the way. In fact, we have a, one of our sitting uh, current graduate of the Air Force Academy who's a member of Congress, Martha McSally, was an A-10 pilot. So um, it's, uh, it's still a small percentage, though. It's only 3 to 4 percent of women pilots in the Air Force or three to four percent of pilots in the Air Force are, are women or people of color. And so I would just make on a personal note here, please inspire young kids to say, you can do anything. And, uh, and people, sometimes it's hard to know you can do something if you don't see somebody who looks like you. And it's hard to find if these small numbers in our country. But I hope that you'll inspire kids to know they can do anything. And there, there are many ways uh, to serve. And we don't want to lose the talent that's out there. Uh, so I think we need, if we have more and more people in the rated fields, that would be phenomenal in a lot of ways. And we, we appreciate their service that way. And you know, and you can have a life. That's the other thing. When people see us in uniform and they uh, see us doing the hard things. They don't realize that we do have a life. I met my husband flying a C-141 uh, and a mission in, in the 1980s. And uh, it took us a long time to get around to getting married. We just are hitting our 25th wedding anniversary this summer, though. So that's good. And we, but we had to live apart a lot. That's why our twins are 12. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's been a phenomenal thing. And the things you learn and help you appreciate. And when one of the missions I flew in 141s, I was in Khartoum, Sudan in about 1985. And uh, the Civil War is there and the tragedies there have gone on for a long time. And it's a pretty Spartan uh, airfield. And when the other pilot and I went up the, uh, the stairs to the tower to do, the, do that pilot stuff, file the flight plan, um, it was just a weird setup. There were five men and one microphone. And for those of you who've flown, you know that if it's not normal that clearance delivery, ground control, tower control, departure, and arrival would all have the same microphone. Um, um, so it just struck me as funny. And as we turned around to walk out, I, I was kind of laughing and I kind of stumbled on the steps and I kind of clumped along and made a lot of noise. And I looked up as we get to the landing, and there were these two veiled ladies working hard to scrub the steps. I mean, and it just hit me. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in my flight suit and my boots and my cropped hair and laughing. And I hope that in that little microsecond of thought, you're thinking, I hope I'm not being the ugly American. I'm not trying to, to disparage them. But they gave me a look over their veils. It was like, I don't know how you say, you go girl in Sudanese, but I really, <laughs> I really felt it. And, um, In about in, in 2007, as a brigadier general, I was uh, going on a, something that the other flag officers in the audience would know was capstone, where uh, the one stars from all the different services go in and really try to understand, 
each other better and the missions of the Department of Defense for about six weeks. And I found myself in Ethiopia. And I met this amazing woman who was running a, a clinic south of Addis Ababa. And uh, amazing, she was the only person in her village to get an education beyond fourth grade. And she was running this clinic and she was fantastic. And I said, can I ask you a question? I said, you know, 20 years ago, this happened. And I've always wondered, and it's a different country in a different time, and you don't know the ladies that, that I saw, but is it possible that they could have been look, giving me that look of affirmation that I really felt? And she goes, oh, absolutely, I know it was, because I'm gonna go tell my family that American women can serve and do technical things and have families and be happy, and uh, they need to know that. And so I thought, you know what, I'm so lucky to have been born where I was, when I was, and I hope none of us really forget that ever, how fortunate we are to be in this country. So. So I just, uh, we've, we've come so far, and yet things are still changing a bit. The, the combat roles changed, um, again, in 1993 for flying. Um, but, you know, over the last decade, we've lost 130 women killed and 800 wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, non-combat in name only. Again, um, sadly, they're difficult to find front lines in the nature of combat that we have now. And we've lost a couple of, uh, of graduates of the Air Force Academy, one of whom was one of my students, uh, Laura Piper, who we lost in the Black Hawk shoot-down, and uh, Raj Schultz, uh, Raj Schulte, I should say, was, uh, was killed by an IED in 2006, an intelligence officer from the Air Force. So um, we serve together, we defend America together, and, and sadly we die together. Um, so that's why the Secretary of Defense recently, uh, Secretary Panetta, lifted the ban on women in combat across all services, and there are still only uh, seven jobs in the Air Force that are closed to women. But the, the point is not the gender, it's just the people of the talent. If you can do the work, if we can uh, help contribute and cross the bar and, and keep the, the standards the same, but make sure we don't exclude anybody of talent, uh, we'll all be the better for it, and that's, that's where we're headed now. So, um, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's great. So as for me, I, I always, uh, I really do defer to people who've uh, suffered more, far more than I have. I loved the mobility mission. I was, flew around the world and, uh, and, and loved what I did. And we were able to balance our life. I was a garrison commander, a wing commander uh, in Air Force terms when I had the boys. And my husband actually retired at 20 years then. Um, so that's one advantage of being older parents. Um, so I, I don't want to trivialize Molly Corbin's uh, experience by um, comparison, but we sort of had the reverse Molly Corbin thing. My husband retired to not man a, man a uh, cannon, but to take care of twin boys. So it was sort of a, it was sort of a role reversal. And uh, as I said before, um, I've experienced many firsts, and it's mostly a matter of timing, and I just hope that I've been able to be prepared as I go through. Um, and I try to apply all those experiences now as a superintendent of the Air Force Academy. Uh, I've tried to do my homework and my history. I love it that you revere history here. I do as well. I read a lot about Douglas MacArthur, who was the superintendent of West Point in 1920, 1919, 1920. And uh, it was fascinating to me to think about uh, history. So he, his harshest critics were sort of the Civil War generation. And yet he was trying to modernize. I look at the Army historian behind me. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Harshest critics were from 50 years before from the Civil War, and yet he was trying to modernize things after World War I. And that's what we're doing at the Air Force Academy. I'm no MacArthur, but um, this isn't 1963, this isn't 1959 or 1981 anymore, it's 2015. And we're trying to think of ways to preserve the traditions, but to deliver them in a modern and relevant way so that the lieutenants that we graduate, and we graduate one-fourth of the officer corps uh, incoming every year at the academy. It, when you get to the end of the game, about half of the generals in the Air Force are, service, are academy graduates. We think maybe that has something to do with what we, what we do on the input side. Um, but as we, we apply this, we want to make sure they're modern and they're inspired and they are creative and they, they can conquer these challenging problems of the future every day and we're excited about it. And we have an amazing group of young men and women. Um, the entering class has SAT scores 150 points uh, higher than the national average. They lead in school, they are people of character, and that's what we demand of them. And uh, when they come out at the other end, they do phenomenally well. We have um, 
our 38th Rhodes Scholar, I was the 22nd Rhodes Scholar, we have our 38th Rhodes Scholar, Rebecca Esselstein, who is also is the Academic All-American Athlete of the Year in the NCAA Division I as a middle distance runner. And she's an astronautics uh, major, and she'll go off to Oxford and, and study that. So not a bad kid. <laughs> Pretty good stuff. And by the way, her classmate, I think one of her classmates is out there. Second Lieutenant Lily Warner out there somewhere. Can you give a shout? Where are you? On the right. There you go. There you go. There she is. Lily's a comp sci, was a comp sci major, and she's going to be a cyber warrior. So the, the nature of warfare is really changing. And you're in the DAR, so way to go. That's awesome. That's great. So also, we've got, obviously, people leading their fields as presidents, CEOs of, of companies. I mentioned before, members of Congress, uh, in addition to Martha McSally. Heather Wilson, class of 82, was a member of Congress from New Mexico and a squadron mate of mine. Uh, it's amazing people we think we're trying to produce to help lead into the 21st century. So just in conclusion, thank you for allowing me to be here um, and to share my story a little bit. I hope that that gives you some sense of just one airman's story. Um, because my story is an Air Force story, and my story is, is a, just one other person who's serving. And again, I just am so impressed and pleased and honored to be around the DAR, an organization that really doesn't let us forget our history and forget the unifying aspects of being an American, not the polarizing political aspects, but the unifying aspects of our nation. Um, we all venerate freedom. Thank you. We all venerate freedom, but we tend to not like the other part of that because responsibility comes with freedom. So, so, so again, thank you very deeply, not just for tonight, but for what you do every day. I'm so honored, and I appreciate what you do every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My honor. Thank you. Get rid of this. Great. Thank you, General Johnson, for your exemplary devotion and service to our nation. We are so pleased to share with the Assembly that on July 5th, we will welcome General Johnson as one of our newest members of the Daughters of the American Revolution. <laughs> General Johnson will become a member of the Zebulon Pike Chapter of the Colorado State Society.